<laughs> Thank you for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. <laughs> to inspire our extraordinarily distinguished guest, who's been to the Constitution Center many times before, I'd like you all to join me in reciting our inspiring mission. Michael, here we go, and it's a very well-trained congregation, so. I, I can see already, yes. that was wonderful. <laughs> the National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Beautiful. It is so urgently important, friends, in these polarized times to open your minds and ears to arguments on all sides of the constitutional debates at the center of our national life. And that's what these town hall programs exist. Following our amazing conversation, what I know will be an amazing conversation with Michael Beschloss this evening, we have next week Ken Starr, who will be casting more light on the questions of presidential power. And I want Ooh. you, and some applause as well, please, on a nonpartisan basis. <laughs> And then we're going to have this remarkable second installment of our Atlantic National Constitution Center Constitutional Conversations. Senators Chris Coons and Jeff Flake met in Washington, and I interviewed them last week. And Chris is coming back, and we hope that Jeff Flake will too on November 28th. And we're going to have an amazing discussion there. And then, of course, there are the We the People podcasts, which you must listen to if you're not doing so already, bringing together the best liberal and conservative thinkers in America on the constitutional questions of the day. We just recorded an hour ago on the question, is there a crisis of legitimacy at the Supreme Court with former clerks for justices Kavanaugh and Sotomayor? And it was an amazing discussion, and I want you to educate yourself about that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Beschloss literally needs no introduction. He's an old friend of the Constitution Center who's spoken here many times before, most recently for his last book on presidential courage when he was interviewed by David Broder, that great dean of American journalism. And I'm going to introduce him now, and you'll have a sense of how lucky we are to have him here tonight, by noting that just uh, about an hour ago, before he came onto stage, he found out that his book was just published and immediately shot up to number three on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> Following Bill O'Reilly and Tucker Carlson, which is a pretty right. <laughs> impressive. We're, we're not partisan here at all. Not at all. <laughs> but for such a substantial, uh, illuminating, serious, but narratively engaging work of history to uh, become a national bestseller immediately is both a sign of the hunger in America for substance and also to Michael Beschloss's astonishing skill as America's leading presidential storyteller. Please join me in welcoming Michael Beschloss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, and the fact that I love being here and I hope to come back more often in the audience. Uh, my older son, Alex, is a medical student at the University of Pennsylvania, so I've got an excuse to come. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. The Constitution is a theme throughout this book, and your overriding message is that the framers would have been appalled by the present state of presidential power because they expected Congress, not the president, to make war. Tell us more about what the framers expected. Well, what they thought was, uh, everyone can hear okay? I guess if you can't hear, you can't respond. Even in the back? <laughs> uh, okay, thanks. We'll talk. Uh, the idea of the founders was, as you all know, that they were really worried that a president of the United States would become authoritarian, would become something like a king. Uh, On a nonpartisan basis. This is nonpartisan. This, this, this is history, folks. This is, uh, this is ancient. Uh, with no relevance to our time. Uh, they were worried that a president of the United States would get too powerful. And one of the ways that they knew that kings of England and other monarchs and dictators in Europe got powerful was if the king became unpopular, one way that he would restore his popularity would be to uh, 
fabricate a reason for an unnecessary war. The country would go to war, the nation would unite, and everyone would love the king who was the chief commander. The founders were terrified that that would ha happen with presidents of the United States, that they would get the United States involved in unnecessary wars for political reasons, for their own glorification. Uh, and as a result, when they discussed the Constitution right here in Philadelphia, 1787, there was a debate over how you do that. And what they decided was give the war power not to the chief of state, as was the case in England, but give it to the Congress to make sure that you didn't have this terrible thing happen. And one of the people who felt the most strongly about this was the gentleman we just saw in the next room, James Madison. So uh, the way I look at Madison is great founder, not a terrific president. And as I write about him in the book, uh, in 1812, he is running for re-election, and he is seduced by members of Congress, beginning with the War Hawks, who say, we've got to have a war with England. Uh, the British are harassing our ships, and what's more, wouldn't it be nice to have a war that we could use to grab Canada so that Canada can be part of the United States? And what you see, it's almost heartbreaking. Madison, who in Philadelphia, years earlier had felt so strongly about making sure that this new country never get involved in unnecessary wars, he does that very thing. Goes to Congress and says, we need a war. He was vain enough to think that it would be good for him. He had a uniform made for himself with braid and a gleaming sword at his side. He didn't have a big military re record, so this was great for Madison. He had a bicorn hat with a feather and looked like a commander-in-chief. But the point is that James Madison of 1787 was presumably devoted to doing exactly the opposite, preventing presidents from doing this. So the way I open the book is to look at what Madison did in 1812 in getting involved in this War of 1812 as almost original sin because it opened the door to a host of presidents across 200 years getting in this country into wars that were not always necessary and not supported by the American people, and sometimes uh, woven with lies. Uh, one final question, sorry for the long answer. No, no, no. Uh, you know, I sort of look at it this way. What was the most unpopular war in American history? It wasn't Vietnam, it was 1812. And uh, what was the first war in American history that we lost? In my view, it was not Vietnam, it was the War of 1812 because we never achieved those war aims uh, and because it was wrongly looked at as a success, it encouraged later presidents to seek war themselves. So, so to tell us more about the War of 1812 uh, because it's such a crucial story. It was passed over the objection of about half the country. You say, what right. were the politics that allowed Madison to be goaded into it? Uh, what were the goals that he failed to achieve? And could it have been otherwise? If, if he hadn't started it, how would history have been different? Well, his thing was that we need a war of England. Uh, it was billed as our second war of independence, which I think is obscene to call it that, because to equate the War of 1812 with the Revolutionary War as sublime and as important that was to this country is just, you know, it was ridiculous. But he was trying to package that war to be popular. And, and to say that it was necessary to have a major war against England to stop the harassment of our ships, and what's more, to seize Canada, you know, that gets pretty far from the ideals that the founders had about what this nation would be like, you know, seizing the territory of another country you know, and that just happened in what, 30 years? Not even 30 years. Uh, and so the war began. A couple of weeks after the beginning of war, uh, Madison got the news that the British Parliament had passed a resolution saying that they would stop American ships, so on, uh, stop harassing American ships. So, on top of everything else that I've said, the reason for war had disappeared. Uh, we've seen that in modern times too major war with the cause of war suddenly went up in smoke. Uh, but rather than doing perhaps the honorable thing, which would have been to say, okay, uh, 
I'm glad we achieved our objective without war. Madison pressed on, the war went on for about two and a half years, and the peak experience of that war, at least in terms of drama, is the scene that I really open the book with, at least the narrative, is uh, everyone know about August 1814, what happened? British came in and burned the Capitol, burned the White House. Uh, Madison fled as a fugitive. He went across the Potomac on a barge. He was running through a wet forest late at night, uh, partly running, partly on his galloping horse. And he couldn't help himself from stopping every few minutes and turning around because the sight he saw across the Potomac was Washington disappearing into a, a swirl of hellfire, the British burning the city that James Madison had done so much to make possible. And, and the way I put it is that, you know, this is a horrible fate for Madison as the president of the United States, fourth president, to have this fate of here he is running through the forest like a common criminal looking for Dolly who had fled herself, worried that the British would catch up with them and hang them both. They would have been perfect battle trophies and if the British had found them, that's exactly what they would have done. And I hate to put it that way, but you know, to my mind as someone who really worries about presidents getting too much power both then and now, uh, it was sort of rough justice for James Madison to have this fate in return for what I see as his dastardly deed in not only starting a war that wasn't necessary, but starting a war that would license later presidents who were of much less stature than James Madison to do exactly the same thing. Madison wasn't the only founder who betrayed his constitutional principles. You also tell about President Jefferson's splendid little conflict. Uh, and Jefferson, of course, was also criticized for betraying his strict constructionist principles with the Louisiana Purchase. So tell right. us about Jefferson's war and whether the limited executive vision that Jefferson and Madison embraced at the convention just was unrealistic. In yeah, well, it sure was unrealistic given that you're fighting wars that are not necessary. Uh, but with Jefferson, Jefferson is sort of the hero, of, at least a hero of the book, because anyone here ever heard of the Chesapeake and the Leopard? All right, well, one or two. Uh, if you read this book, you will learn all about it. Uh, uh, 1807, June, off of Norfolk, we had a ship called the Chesapeake. The Brits had a ship called the Leopard. Leopard fired against the Chesapeake and won this naval engagement, and the Chesapeake surrendered. And Americans were outraged as they read about what had happened. The British felt such license to do this to a peaceful American ship. And you know this outrage came to the White House. And if Thomas Jefferson had wanted to be a war president, if he'd wanted to get a hat with a feather and the sword at his side, he said later on, he said, all I would have had to do was to open my hand and let the winds of war begin. And he was absolutely right, because people were so outraged, they would have been glad to go to war with the Brits. But Jefferson was peace-loving, as Jeff well knows, and as many of you know, he had a philosophical aversion to war. He was worried that it would lead to big government, big taxes. That was a Federalist enterprise to him. It was not a Jeffersonian enterprise. But for our purposes, this was five years before his weaker Secretary of State, James Madison, became president. But Jefferson practiced his ideals, and he stopped the stampede toward war. And I wish later presidents had taken the Jefferson example rather than the Madison example. The president you turn to after Madison is President Polk, well thought of as a president, but not by the young congressman Abraham Lincoln, who accused- no, Nor by me. Nor by you. <laughs> well, you're in very good uh, company. I, so was Lincoln. I'm a distant second to Lincoln. <laughs> no, no. Distance. But it's a great <coughs> constitutional story, as you tell it. So Polk insists that um, Mexican troops have invaded, which justifies the president's unilateral <coughs> action. And the young Lincoln- to Total lie. Yeah, the young Lincoln says, identify the spot where right. the troops crossed, earning him the Lincoln spotty Lincoln. Right. So tell us more about that story. Well, uh, 
Pope was a great guy, but he was a liar and a cheat and a bully. Uh, <laughs> Aside from so, that, Mrs. Lincoln, he was a great right, president. Right, yes. Otherwise, yes. he was a lovely man. <laughs> yes. And just the kind of person the founders wanted to see as president, don't yes. you think? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so Pope comes to office, and he has an ulterior motive, which is a good motive. And a lot of these presidents, in fact, all of them, you're always looking at ends versus means. So the end that Polk secretly wanted was he wanted to steal a, nearly a million square miles of territory from the Mexicans. New Mexico, California, you know, land that would make this a continental nation from coast to coast. With me so far, that's a good thing. But the bad part is he did it by cheating and lying and vi violating the Constitution, which I assume you're all against here, right? Very much. Okay, right. Yes. Good. Don't ever think of it, uh, right, ladies and right. gentlemen, at home. Yes, yes. no one asked, uh, at least while you're on the premises. Yes. Uh, so what he did was, and it was even worse, he fabricated a fake incident along the Mexican-Texas border, provoked local Mexicans to attack American troops. They did so, and so Polk then went to Congress and said, aha, our troops have been attacked by the Mexicans, and it was a tiny incident. I mean, it was fabricated and it was provoked, but even then it was a small incident. So he goes to Congress and says, we Americans have been attacked by the Mexicans, and so in return for that, we need to have a major war that's going to take about two years, and American troops have to march all the way to Mexico City. And he got the war declaration from Congress. And the war did take about two years, and the result was that as part of the settlement, he said to the Mexicans, if you want peace, part of this is going to have to be that you're going to have to give up all those square miles of territory to the United States for a nominal fee. And that's what they did. So as I say, the good part is that we became a continental nation. But the bad part is you had a president who was doing even worse things than Madison had, and a very bad example for later presidents. And just as Je Jeff is saying, one of the things I try to sort of convey in the book is that this is not like eight chapters on eight presidents, eight wars. It sounds like a, a Washington's birthday mattress sale. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, it's a continuous story because all these people were interwoven with this whole history. For instance, the War of 1812 ends and little James Polk gets a cane that's emblazoned with scenes of the War of 1812. The Battle of Fort McHenry, which I have actually a painting on, of the, on, on the front of this book, Star Spangled Banner. And, and that's one problem, by the way, with the War of 1812 is because there's, there's so many great scenes, you know, don't give up the ship and the Star Spangled Banner and old Ironsides was very easy for later presidents to sell this as a victory that it was not. And one person who was mesmerized by that was young James Polk. So when he went to war against Mexico, he was doing it partially, he said, in the name of James Madison and that great victory in 1812 that was never a victory. And I'm sort of showing how all these people are all woven together. As Jeff was saying, uh, 1847, Lincoln rises. And one of the few who's brave enough to challenge the commander-in-chief and say basically this war was based on a lie. And also something that Lincoln said that was very important. He wrote a letter to his law partner back in Illinois. And he says, this is not quite the language, but pretty close to it. I think it is immoral for a single man to be able to take the United States into war. It's not what the founders ever intended. Yet one of the stories of this book is that over 200 years, step by step, these presidents took us into a situation where nowadays a president can take us into war almost single-handedly, almost overnight. Uh, Lincoln and the Constitution, a huge topic. Uh, you argue that Lincoln, uh, believing that all the laws but one should not go unexecuted, broadly acted within the Constitution, and when he had to exercise extra constitutional powers, sought congressional authorization after the fact. After. Of course, there's a contrary view that he 
that he broke the Constitution. Tell right. us why you think that ultimately he was a constitutional well, president. Well, this is why I cut Lincoln some slack. Uh, number one, I come from Illinois. They'd never, never let me back in if I didn't. <laughs> uh, but the real reason is that I hate it when there's even a question of violating the Constitution, needless to say, especially here. Uh, and beyond that, I look, did the president do this out of a lust for power and expanding his own authority? There's no sign of that with Lincoln. When he did this, he did it modestly. It pained him to do it. He felt that it was necessary to fulfill his oath of office to defend the Constitution, which says that states cannot secede. And he also very explicitly, and no later president did this when they seized too much power from my point of view. He said, I want it to be known by future presidents that in, for instance, suspending habeas corpus or some of the other corner cutting that he certainly did, I do not want this to be a model for later presidents. This is something I'm doing because I think it's absolutely necessary and I'm not enjoying it. It's because there's a national emergency. So the question you have to ask, is this someone who wanted to be an authoritarian and war was a great excuse to become one? No, it was exactly the opposite of that. Does Lincoln show that a constitutional war presidency is possible? And what does he teach his successors? Well, he did cut some corners. And although he said this is one situation not intended to be a model, the problem is that not every later president will feel that way. For instance, anyone here read Richard Nixon's memoirs? Oh, come on. You, you don't know what you're it's missing. About, it's, it's even longer than my book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's uh, a very long book, and in that very long book, he says Abraham Lincoln violated the Constitution because he was a war president. Well, I was a war president too. That's the problem. Just another beat on it, because it's so crucially important. He combines technical precision and attentiveness to constitutional arguments with a willingness to act boldly when he thinks that exigency right. requires it. He did. Uh, and it's hard to f find a case in which he did that in which he felt it was not absolutely necessary. And the, the defense of himself was, number one, I'm doing this to fulfill my constitutional oath. That was, you know, that sort of overrides everything else. And the other thing, you know, for all those who said at the time and later, Lincoln is doing this because he wants to become a tyrant, he really didn't. And if you think of the kind of temperament that the founders wanted to see in a president of modesty and restraint, in other words, George Washington, in terms of temperament, Lincoln really lives up, lives up to that ideal as I see it. How important was Lincoln's conviction that secession was unconstitutional to his war vision? It was important to him, but in his heart, he knew that this was a war against the evil of slavery, which he had hated since he was a young man. And there's some psychobiographers who I think may have a little something here in saying, does everyone know about Lincoln's father? Lincoln's father was illiterate and brutish and very nasty to him. And when Lincoln would read books as a young man, the father would say, you're wasting your time, you're being lazy, and made Lincoln feel like a slave in the way that his father, and this is the word that was used, in the way that his father you know, put him to work doing manual labor. And so from that time, Lincoln had an enormous sense of justice and that expanded when he would go on the Mississippi Re River and see slaves being abused. So his feelings against slavery had gone for a long time. At the same time, he was a lawyer. He felt that when he became president, it was best to try to see if you know, he could solve the problem by conciliation. So about the first year or two, you see what Lincoln said and wrote, it was mainly, you know, this is not a war against slavery, you know, I'm not gonna take a position one way or another. This is really a war just to enforce the Constitution and bring North and South back together and carry out the provision of the Constitution that states do not have the right to secede. 
And it didn't really work because he was tying himself up into knots and he was not saying what was in his heart. And two lessons here. Number one, presidents should really say what is in their hearts and that makes them better leaders in almost every case that I know of, at least more effective ones and they connect more with the people. And the other thing is, this is a lesson throughout the book, if you're a president waging a war because of our glorious history and the DNA of this country, it has to be waged on a, war, a moral plane. Lincoln, it just didn't work when Lincoln kept on saying, you know, I'm just doing this as a lawyer trying to sort of mend North and South. But once he began talking about the evils of slavery and saying that, and he said to his peers, I think that I will go down in history not just as the successful commander in chief of the Union Army, I think that I will go down in history as the liberator of a race. Once he was singing that music, he became a much greater leader and a much more effective one because I think Union soldiers, they didn't all agree, but those who did felt that they were fighting for a cause, not just for a legal principle. One more important beat on Lincoln. Uh, Sean Wilentz was just here uh -huh. on his remarkable oh, new book, incredible Sorry to book uh, about anti-slavery in the Constitution, uh -huh. where he notes that Lincoln and Cooper Union resurrected Madison's notes, which had just been published in 1840, and identified the passage where Madison said, the Constitution takes no position on whether there can be bondage in human beings. And Lincoln then announced the new birth of freedom right. and thought that a constitutional amendment was necessary to This is the time fulfill. to go beyond, absolutely. Exactly. T tell us more about the evolution in his thinking about slavery and the Constitution. Well, well, Lincoln had been a pretty or orthodox Whig politician before, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very political by nature, but sometimes I can't resist. He read history, and even better than that, he read books, uh, and, and did, not, did not have it as a badge of honor that he did not read books. Uh, uh, you, I, I'm making a point. It's, it's, this is not a political. It, we could I, find I to say, applaud for reading books at the National yeah. Constitution Center. The, the point I'm trying to make is that one thing that unites all the leaders that I read that I write about here, and you know, I think reading books should not be a political issue. No. Uh, every single one of them read history, uh, some more than others, and two examples really stand out to me. Number one, uh, Abraham Lincoln, who had, what, about a year and a half of formal education. And the formal education was blab school, it was called, you know, kids of all ages in a one-room schoolhouse. And they were, the, the teachers were shouting at them. So really, he was completely self-taught. And that's something to really honor about Lincoln. The even better example, from my point of view, is Harry Truman. Harry Truman, had uh, a high school education and nothing more. And the reason for that was that he wanted to go on to college. This brilliant young man, very curious, and I write about him later in the book, his family said, you can't go to college because we can't afford it. You have to go back to the plow and plow our far farmland. And one of the tragedies is this young man could not go to college. And I can't think of any better example of the American idea that you can become a great leader no matter who your family is or how much money you grow up with it, but you can teach yourself and become a great leader. Harry Truman said he couldn't function as president without knowing history because he said that uh, when he had a tough problem, he would always think back, to, and he's probably better read in presidential history I think more than almost any other president that I can think of, even though he didn't have a college education. And, and actually, the, the book that he liked most of all was a book that was called, terribly politically incorrect, Great Men and Famous Women. <laughs> uh, the idea women could not be great, only famous, and the subtitle was From Nebuchadnezzar to Sarah Bernhardt. So as you could see, this book covered a wide swath of human experience. <laughs> and so what Truman said was, when I had to deal with a problem like dropping the bomb or Korea, I thought back to that book, and I doubt if he thought back to Nebuchadnezzar or Sarah Bernhard, but he would think about Abraham Lincoln or General Jackson, 
and there was enough of a parallel that they would enlighten him at a time that he was tired and had to make about 90 decisions at once. But that is what helps a president get through particular war. One is religion, hmm. one is your friends and family. You know, I deal a lot in this book with how these eight presidents had an experience that no others have shared, no other Americans, no other American presidents, which is to send that many people off to die. Uh, and so essentially what kind of things are common through them and these very different people have a lot more things in common than you might think. This is a profound point. Uh, Ma Madison insisted that only through the study of history could citizens be worthy of uh, citizenship in the Republic. Right. And, and Washington said the science of government. So, in fact, could I interrupt for a second? Please. And another part of this, and you know, the reason why I think that reading and writing history is sacred is not just because I do it and Jeff does it, but that gets into the kind of country our founders were trying to establish. If you were in England, there was no history because the king would make the decisions. The documents, for the most part, were not released to the public. If the king made mistakes, and he made a lot of them, you'd never hear about it, so the mistakes were erased. The founders, by contrast, said, in our republic, we're going to do it differently. We're going to keep exact documents of everything. You know, anyone seen the notes that were taken at the Constitutional Convention? Took a while for them to become open, but they made sure that there was a record. They wanted to make sure that there was a documentary record open to every citizen as quickly as possible, by contrast with England, so that we could ruthlessly examine the behavior of our leaders and also previous recent generations of citizens and say, what did they do right? What did they do wrong? And we'd benefit from that. So history is not just you know reading storybooks that may be entertaining or learning dates and facts. It's a very patriotic act because it's the only way you improve your country is if you're constantly saying, you know, where did we fall short? How can we make it better? This is so important. This is why it's so important that all of you are here learning from history tonight. It's why Lincoln said to the young men of Springfield that without the study of history, we would fall the way of Athens and the mob. And now I want to ask, and then there's something so moving about Harry Truman just falling asleep with the lighting, reading light on, mm -hmm. reading Plutarch and yep. to, to guide his decisions. With, with a green eye shade over his eyes. Uh, yeah. Very much of his time and place. FDR was a great amateur historian and student of history too. How did the study of history inform his decisions in World War II? Uh, in ways that are sort of unexpected and we're really lucky. In 1940, Roosevelt was thinking, do we get involved? in a war with Hitler or not, and if so, what kind of a president am I going to be? And guess what book he was reading that year? He was reading Carl Sandburg's biography of Abraham Lincoln. And if I had, if, if there was a book I would want in Roosevelt's recent memory as he begins to wage uh, America's role in World War II, that would be it, because what are the lessons? Just as I was saying earlier, make sure you wage the war on a moral plane, do what Lincoln did in terms of constantly telling Americans what you're doing, what the war is intended to accomplish, be patient if there are setbacks. It's one of the reasons why Roosevelt did those fireside chats so regularly. And he'd go on the radio and he would say, he would have the White House put out in advance, the president would like all citizens to buy maps at their local store, or, or cut one out of the newspaper or buy Globe so that while he talks about what's going on in the Pacific or maybe in North Africa, everyone can follow along. He felt that, that was very important and one of the influences on him, he said, was that he had so recently read about Abraham Lincoln. Well, that's the, I think there's something so moving about mm -hmm. Lincoln's, uh, FDR's respect for citizens, asking him to follow him on the maps. What was it that Lincoln had done that inspired him in that regard? Well, it was the fact that you had a leader who was leveling with the, with the public all the time. And that was in contrast to the president. He served very closely uh, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, whose name was? 
Woodrow Wilson. Yes, excellent. Uh, and I am not a Woodrow Wilson fan. Uh, his views on race are, to my mind, disqualifying. They were not of his time and place. They were extreme. He threw African Americans out of the government. Uh, he was much less advanced on race than Theodore Roosevelt or his successor, Warren Harding, of all people. But most of all, from, from my way of seeing things, Roosevelt sort of came to World War II with perhaps more experience than any other president because he had been close, at least in proximity, to Wilson. And also, all through most, uh, all of World War I, uh, FDR uh, was all the time talking to a cousin of his, and they were both talking about all the things that Wilson was doing wrong, and the cousin of his was named Theodore Roosevelt. So one of the things that they thought that Wilson, Wilson did wrong, which I feel strongly about and I write about, is that for about the first year of our maybe year and a half of involvement in World War I and the centennial of the peace is in a couple of weeks, 100 years next month. Uh, you'd think, you know, a lot of things wrong with Wilson from my point of view, but one thing you figure that you'd be getting from him is eloquent speeches that explain how the war is going and why we're fighting. And it turns out Wilson spent most of his first year during that war sitting in the White House in this kingly remove, saying almost nothing, letting people draw their own conclusions. And then immediately, once the peace occurs, 100 years ago next month, everyone know the term mission creep? It wasn't used in those days, but the most spectacular example of mission creep that I can think of. Suddenly, surprise, you Americans didn't know this, but turns out after all, this is a, not only a war, you know, we went in for specific reasons in the North Atlantic. Well, just want to let you know, this is a war to end all wars, make the world safe for democracy, and also a peace organization called the League of Nations, about which I have not assured you yet that it will not take away your sovereignty and send your kids off to war uh, for reasons that have not much to do with Congress. So suddenly he had a big role as public educator to fulfill, and so what does he do? He goes to Europe for about six months because only he can negotiate the peace in Paris and fulfill this treaty. And the result was that even if you like the League of Nations, which I do, I mean, he left, there were no modern communications, and the result was he left the field in this country totally to the people who hated the League, like Henry Cabot Lodge, and they spent those six months telling Americans why it was a terrible idea so that by the time Wilson got back, it was impossible. The League never became what it should have been, and Wilson, because of one mistake after another that I've mentioned, the League doesn't happen. You can make the argument, which I would, it leads to the rise of Adolf Hitler and the onset of World War II. So mistakes that had big consequences. Uh, we're going to have to get the Wilson Anti-Defamation League for what I have said. But, uh, but anyway, long way of saying, in Roosevelt's mind, you were asking about history all throughout World War II, were all the mistakes that Woodrow Wilson had made, especially his failure to get Americans to understand and back the League. That's why Roosevelt made such an effort, really beginning at about the middle of World War II, to explain to Americans, not only do we have to win World War II, which he rightly called the Survival War, which is a title chapter, a chapter title of mine, not only do we have to win the war, but also we have to make sure that it ends with an international organization that will make sure that this never happens again. That's why he was a great man, with a couple of exceptions. Large ones. <laughs> it is remarkable that the former Princeton professor of constitutional law uh, was such a poor public educator, and you quote King George V saying that he was sort of a cloistered academic, and if that wasn't bad enough... In fact, Jeff, I had, there's a famous Wilson scholar who's a friend of mine, I think he shall remain nameless uh, since I haven't asked him if it's okay to say this in public. But I sent my chapters on Wilson to him to have him take a look, knowing that he likes Wilson. And if I'd gone too far, 
he'd let me know. And so the comments in the margins were things like, would you mind taking out the words conceited and messianic? <laughs> <laughs> It just seems descriptive uh, right. in his case. That's what I thought. Absolutely. I should have sent those to you, Jeff. Yes, no, spot on. You were being restrained. Right. Well, because we haven't talked, as you, but you do in the book, about his appalling record on free speech, uh, right. imprisoning Terrible. his opponents under the Espionage Act and being right. one of the worst presidents on the first And time. by the way, to make this bipartisan, because uh, I know apartisanship is important yes, here yes, as it yes. is to me, that was used by President Obama and is now being used by President Trump to pursue journalists. Yes. To what, Wilson was the first president to insist that the president was a steward of the people who directly channeled popular will. To what degree was his As long as the will was dictated by him. By him, exactly, yeah. yes. To what degree was that populist conception of executive power related to his excesses on free speech? I think his definition of popular will was that he was the brilliant one and people should listen and follow. Yeah. Uh, which, again, getting back to the gentleman we saw in the next room, our great founders, I don't think that's what they had in mind. Yeah. So this book, uh, in addition to being an instant bestseller, made front page news of the New York Times with its revelations about Lyndon Johnson and his efforts to remove nuclear weapons from Vietnam over the advice of his generals. Tell us more about that amazing story and, of course, more about how you found it in the first place. Yeah, well, uh, I love LBJ for civil rights. I love Medicare. Uh, I love certain other things he did in the Great Society. Uh, I don't love him so much for most of Vietnam, which I think is one of the great catastrophes in American history and which he could have avoided. Uh, and one of the stories I show is that not only did he make monumental mistakes in Vietnam, but, uh, you know, I did these two books on Johnson's tapes. You know, he made 700 hours of tapes of his private conversations that are just an unbelievable source on his private thinking that we never would have had otherwise. And one of the worst moments in the course of that was in early 1965, and I have it in the book, the month that he's beginning to send off large number of young idealistic Americans to fight in Vietnam and telling them, go get a victory, we'll get it soon. In private, he's talking to someone who I see as one of the villains of history, his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, who is saying, we've got to get in this war, you'll be vilified, it's what John Kennedy would have wanted. And then four, four, four years later was saying, I had nothing to do with it, it was all Johnson. But fortunately for Johnson, there were tapes that show McNamara cheerleading for the war in Vietnam in early 1965. So Johnson is talking on this tape to McNamara, and he says these horrifying words that broke my heart when I heard them first. Johnson says, I can't think of anything worse than losing the war in Vietnam, and I do not see any way that we can win. Now, if the founders were here, and I, I hate always saying, you know, who knows what they would say, but I think it's safe to say they would have thought that just one of the worst things you could do if you were president of the United States is to send young Americans to die under false pretenses, under the illusion that it's for a struggle, a war that you think you're gonna win for noble reasons, and in fact, at the very beginning of the war, in private, have no thought that you're gonna win the war at all. And when I first heard that tape, I thought, well, maybe everyone gets discouraged, maybe he was just depressed. Johnson was very subject to depression. But I had, I, at the time I was working on this, I knew Lady Bird Johnson, who died in 2007, and got to know her pretty well, so she kindly gave me the unpublished parts of her diaries. She taped a diary almost every day. In the summer of 1965, she says, Lyndon is so depressed about the war in Vietnam, he told me about the war, I feel as if I'm in a plane that's crashing and I do not have a parachute. So a lot of the story that I tell about Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam is from the inside based on probably about three and a half years of these tapes that were not in my earlier books and have largely not been heard before. That Largely the story is of LBJ's emotional breakdown. He becomes more paranoid, 
on these tapes, he says that Martin Luther King is not a communist, but he's controlled by communists. He claims that Robert Kennedy is giving money to rioters in Chicago to embarrass Johnson. He claims that Chinese communists are stuffing cash in the pockets of J. William Fulbright, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and that's the reason why Fulbright is against the war. He was getting worse and worse and making a lot of mistakes that we all know about. But turns out in January of 1968, he, he did a very good deed, which is that, as Jeff is referring to, his commander, William Westmoreland, uh, said, we're facing a dangerous battle that we might lose, Quezon, and we might lose this whole war. Why not fix it by moving tactical weapon, nuclear weapons to Vietnam and using them if necessary? Word was brought back to the White House. Johnson took one listen to this and said, absolutely not. I've been working for years keeping this war limited so that it didn't go nuclear, so it would not provoke the Russians and the Chinese to come in, in which it might go nuclear. And he knew that there's always a danger that escalation will lead to a general nuclear war. That was ever present during the Cuban Missile Crisis, where he was a member of XCOM. And so he said, not only you know, tell Westmoreland nothing doing, but I want every document that has been generated suggesting that nuclear weapons be brought into Vietnam. I want them locked up immediately, and I want this whole thing kept secret because it's an election year. I don't want these generals saying that they could have won this war and, with nuclear weapons and Johnson is muzzling them and keeping them from doing things that would lead to a victory, so lock them all up. So the documents were kept locked up for decades and a few were locked up until about the last year or two and they finally came open and I saw them and wrote about this story. So it's sort of man bites dog. I think all of us who've written on Lyndon Johnson were so used to cataloging his failings. It's refresh refreshing to find a moment, not only where he did a good thing, but it also shows how important it is, especially if you have a president of war, to make sure that you have someone with the wisdom and the judgment and the will and the skill to shut down something like that. You know, you always hear sometimes people say, why don't you let the generals run the war? Well, this is why the generals should not be allowed to run the war. They have a point of view that is what it should be, you know, how you deal with the, the mission that's been given to them militarily, but they do not have the broader view that is the view that is only held by the President of the United States, and that is exactly as the founders expected. It is time for questions from the audience. In your scholarly opinion, which American war or wars were justified? Well, I think you can make an argument that they were all justified at one level or another. Uh, and also, I hope it goes without saying, the, the people I admire most in this book are not the presidents, but the soldiers. We should be so proud of the record of our soldiers over 200 years. And, and what, Thank you for that. What, and what drives me crazy is when the enormous heroism of those great soldiers is not matched by heroism in, the, in, the, in our presidents. Uh, you know, that's what this, you know, I measure our presence against a standard of perfection, but that's what the founders wanted. You know, they were idealistic that, you know, you could have leaders that were functioning in a society that worked better and was more noble than any, any before. So, uh, so in any case, you're asking which of these wars were justified. Uh, 1812, hard to make the argument for that one. Uh, Mexican War, you can certainly justify in terms of becoming a coast-to-coast -coast nation, but I wish that Polk were not a liar and a cheat, as I expressed myself <laughs> earlier. Abraham Lincoln, absolutely. Haven't talked about the Mexican War, but it's another ends versus means. Great that we became a world power. You know, we fought in the Philippines, got rid of a dictatorial regime, the Spanish in Cuba. We took Guam and Puerto Rico. You can argue those round or flat. So some good aims, but terrible means, which is that
Americans demanded a war against Spain because of the sinking of the Maine in Havana Harbor, which I tell the story of in a lot of detail. And so we went to war mainly in revenge for the sinking of the Maine. Problem is the Maine was not sunk by the Spanish. It was sunk by a boiler accident. You couldn't go to war against a boiler, but you could go to war against Spain, and that's what happened. So the ends, absolutely, the means, a very bad model for later presidents who, and earlier ones who got us into war for false reasons. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, you know, yes, I could argue for World War I, but I think he was a terrible war president, as I've said. FDR, World War II was a noble cause although I'm very tough on Roosevelt for interning the Japanese, and I really think he could have done a lot more to thwart the Holocaust earlier. Uh, Truman, whom I, one of my heroes, unfortunately not in this book. Uh, at the time of Korea, he became the first president not to bother going to Congress to ask its permission in a war declaration. Uh, what did the founders say about requiring presidents or requiring a war declaration from Congress if a war is going to happen. I think we'd agree that the Constitution says you have to do it. Truman violated the Constitution, never asked for one. So that, decade and a half later, LBJ wants to get involved in Vietnam based on a Gulf of Tonkin, res res Gulf of Tonkin episode, which he calls an unprovoked attack against the, an American ship. A, it wasn't unprovoked. B, he quickly found out there was never any such attack, yet goes to Congress, gets a, doesn't ask for a war declaration once again. His aide said, why? Uh, Johnson says, well, Truman didn't ask for one. I don't have to either. Mm. You're always setting pre precedents for your successors. Don't do bad things like that, Harry Truman. Uh, so Roosevelt, uh, uh, Johnson did not ask for a war declaration. And for the next decade, Johnson and Nixon fought this horrible war for nearly 10 years on the basis of a flimsy resolution from Congress based on an episode that had never happened and was filled with lies. The founders would have been heartbroken if they had seen that our presidents had come to this, I think. And by the way, I repeat, our soldiers in Vietnam were as heroic could, as could be. I wish our presence had not let them down. Uh, a question dear to both of our hearts. Any recommendations on how this history of presidential misuse of power should be taught in schools? Uh, as you see, I, I feel pretty strongly about it. And, and the reason, I mean, everyone says the reason I wrote the book, this really is the reason I wrote the book. I began this book in 2007. It took 10 years to write, so this is not a book that's written out of current events. But I am always really worried, just as the founders were, about presidents getting too much power. And the reason I wrote the book was that I wanted to see if I was right that one of the ways that presidents seize too much power is by going to war, and sometimes by going into unnecessary wars, and sometimes by going into wars because they will glorify the leader and they will unite the people behind the leader in a way that nothing else will. What does that sound like, the British kings that our founders were trying to get away from? And I think that if presidents are trying to accrue power for themselves. Uh, I think that is never a good thing, and the history of war is that it gives them a big opportunity that they don't have at other times. Because if Americans are scared, and if they feel strongly about the aim of a war, they will permit certain things that they might not permit at other times. Presidents can declare martial law at times of war. You know, when presidents have these, uh, and they still have them, began with Eisenhower, presidents will have an emergency exercise of what they will do if there's, let's say, a nuclear attack on the United States. And at least in the old days, Eisenhower and some of his successors, they'd have a real drill, and his helicopter would land outside the Oval Office, and the president would get on the helicopter, and the helicopter would fly, 
to the secret underground command center where a president's supposed to go even to this day in Virginia if nuclear war is about to happen. And the president uh, goes on emergency television, which is being transmitted to whatever televisions can still receive a television signal. And guess what he's supposed to say? He's supposed to say, I declare martial law. And in wartime, presidents will be able to get Americans to agree to all sorts of assumption of power by a president that they never would in peacetime. And so you'd like to think that all of our presidents will have the character to never get us into a war for false political reasons. And if that ever happens, that they do take us into a war for legitimate reasons, they will never abuse the time of war to take on power for themselves. I'm, I've been worried, for example, anyone get a presidential alert announcement on your iPhone? <laughs> That's not something that President Trump invented. That came before President Trump. And I heard about it before President Trump, and I didn't think it was a very good idea when I first heard about it, because maybe the purpose of that is to send a message about a hurricane or about something else, but in the wrong hands to give a president the opportunity to send you messages on your iPhone at any time of the day or night, that is a potential for an abuse of presidential power that chills my blood, and I hope we never have a president who does abuse it in that way. How can... Pr- presidents obfuscate the role of the Constitution in declaring war without congressional approval. They've done it. When was the last time, here's an extra credit question for the audience. Anyone want to remember the last time a president got a war declaration from Congress? What year was it? Do I hear 1941? Do I hear 1942? 1942. And the reason it was 42 was Roosevelt Having gotten a war declaration after Pearl Harbor, there are a couple of Central European countries that he wanted to go after as well a year later, so that's why it's 1942. If the Constitution, uh, if we had presidents who honored the Constitution, uh, Truman would have gone for a war declaration, Lyndon Johnson would have gone for a war declaration in 1964, George H.W. Bush, whom I love and admire and respect, and I hope he's feeling well, I think he's getting better, and had so much to do with helping to develop uh, this institution. Uh, If he were a strict constitutionalist, should not have gone to Congress for a resolution as he did, from my point of view, should have asked for a war declaration. And the same thing is true of George W. Bush and I'm not being mean on them for partisan reasons. I'm just saying that Harry Truman got us off on a very bad footing. The reasons why the founders wanted a war declaration, they weren't just doing it for their health, as my grandmother used to say. They were doing it because they wanted there to be a debate in Congress. And they wanted war to be rare, and one of the ways that you make war rare is to put everyone in Congress on the record for or against. And they wanted a president to go to Congress and say, this is how long it's going to take, and this is how many people might be killed, and this is what it might do to the country domestically, and these are the sacrifices I'm going to ask for Americans. When you just do it with a resolution, that's a weaselly way of getting into war. You're going in through the side door. And the problem is, look at all the people who supported the resolution for military force in Iraq. Uh, only a decade and a half ago. And I'm not going to mention names in the spirit of bipartisanship, which I'm for too. And they were Democrats as well as Republicans. But how many of those people who voted for that resolution, the second that war became unpopular, they said, oh, I didn't know I was voting for war. I was just voting for authorization of armed for, armed for you know, military force. What a terrible thing that George W. Bush did. And it was very unfair to President Bush. It would have been better if he got all those names on the record as in favor of resort to war if necessary. You know, if they're in on the takeoff, they'll have to be there on the crash landing if there is a crash landing. That's the brilliance of our founders in the next room. I think we go astray when we don't listen to them. <laughs>
Uh, it's time for clothing, closing uh, thoughts, although we're loath to close as, as Lincoln was. And you know, the question is the, the obvious one. If you were advising a president who was deciding whether or not to go to war, what would you tell him or her to learn from the Constitution and history? Well, I'd say it has, you know, the war has to be absolutely essential for our national security. It has to have a chance to be overwhelmingly supported by the Congress and the people. And I think I'd also say, take a look at the history of Lyndon Johnson. Because a couple of other tapes, and maybe I'll close with this, you know, just to keep within time. Uh, in 1964, and he taped these, these conversations too, he was on the telephone. Anyone or many people remember who Richard Russell was? Richard Russell was a senator from Georgia. He was the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. Horrible on race, but on military affairs, he was a wise man. Hawkish as could be, was called Mr. Defense. But he's talking to LBJ about the possibility of getting involved in Vietnam. This is early 1964. And Johnson says, you know, I, why, why should I care about Vietnam? You know, this morning my little valet was coming into the bedroom and bringing my clothes, and he's got six little old kids. And if we get involved in a war in Vietnam, he says those kids might die. You know, what should Vietnam mean to him? He's never heard of the place. Americans don't know what Vietnam is. And Russell, you'd expect him to be hawkish as he usually was, says, well, I agree, you know, you know, just get out of that war, Mr. President. And Russell tells him, amazing how wise he was, he says, you get into Vietnam, that war is gonna take 10 years, it'll kill 50 or 60,000 Americans, the college students will be against it and will lose just as we did in Korea. You know, he was telling Johnson exactly what happened. And Johnson, you know, a great politician, he knew that Americans didn't know where, uh, where Vietnam was. He knew even then that it probably was not essential to fight a war in Vietnam in order to prevail in the Cold War. And so here's a case in which he let his really good instincts he didn't listen to them. And here's a case I just so wish I could have gone back in time and say, you know, LBJ, just listen to yourself. Listen to what Russell is telling you. Even if it means saying, Dick, you know, why don't you go to the Senate floor and why don't you demand that I get out of Vietnam? If you say it, you who have a reputation that's sterling for being a great hawk, many other people will go along with you. And then if I get out of Vietnam, in 1965, you can provide me with sort of a human shield against people who might say that I'm soft on communism. So what I would say is any president who is contemplating war, you know, be cognizant of that history. And there is one case in which that actually turned out to be true, which is in the spring of 2009, Barack Obama was contemplating getting much more involved in Afghanistan, you may know and remember, you know, far beyond the surge. And I and a couple of other people recommended that he read a book, not mine, uh, on the slide into Vietnam of LBJ in 1964 and 1965. And Obama and some of his people read it and they said it was a big influence on their thinking, so. Ladies and gentlemen, for all. Thanks. I, 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 was going to invite, I was going to invite applause for the precisely the same point, for, for all he has done to inspire Americans from presidents to all of us to educate ourselves about American history. Please join me in thanking Michael Beschloss. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And could I say one thing? Uh, thank, thank you. And, and, and could we have a, a big hand for Jeff, not only for being brilliant, not only for what he writes, wonderful moderator, but for what he's done for this institution? Thank you. Thanks, Colin.